It seems that the most important relationship with kids these days is with their cell phone. So how do we get them unplugged and offline? How can we get them to reconnect with the land and to get them to understand where their food comes from? Well, stick around because on this episode, we're visiting a place doing just that. If current estimates hold, the population will reach 9 billion by 2038. One of the major problems we face is feeding everyone. Diseases are at an all-time high. The current model for food production is unhealthy and unsustainable. There's got to be a better way. Scientists say that if 14% of the world planted a permaculture garden or some type of garden just in their backyard, we can replenish the entire earth. So we're setting out to find people who are doing things differently. We'll be looking into alternatives to current food practices that are damaging our health and environment. We'll be meeting the chefs, farmers, restaurateurs, and entrepreneurs who are making a difference. And you'll find out just how easy it is for you to become a part of the solution. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Hit that like button, subscribe, tell all your friends. We'll be eating the freshest food, meeting amazing people, and seeing what we can do to become a healthier, more environmentally friendly world right here on The Fork and Truth. We're getting ready to head into the Farm Collaborative in Aspen, Colorado to speak with Edin. Let's go. So welcome to the Farm Collaborative. Uh, this is our farm park and it's the flagship uh, facility that the Farm Collaborative has. We're located in Pitkin County, uh, owned by the city of Aspen on public open space with a conservation easement by the Aspen Valley Land Trust. And we're lucky to share the facility with Cozy Point LLC, which is the equestrian operator. And uh, the concept here is basically pioneering a vision for what a town park can look like. So we're both a working farm and a town park at the same time. All right, awesome. so come on in. So this part of the farm park is uh, what's called a forest garden or a food forest, um, pioneered with a lot of inspiration from Joe Mustantasky at the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. All right. And basically the concept here is that we mimic the layers of a natural forest ecosystem, but everything is edible. So our canopy species is fruit trees, our mid-story is fruiting shrubs, we have raspberries and goji berries and red currants and yellow currants and about 15 other varieties of berries, and then our, our kind of ground cover is more of the perennial herbs. So you see a ton of mint, and the idea here is that mint is actually working on replacing the grasses that come into the area. Right. So eventually weeding will be pulling mint, which is a lot more pleasant. <laughs> and just like in a forest ecosystem, the animals aren't in there pulling weeds and you know, working on fertilizing the soil. I mean, they do so naturally, but it's not necessarily an effort. And so too will the forest garden operate like a natural ecosystem once it's fully stabilized. Right. So this whole area is managed through a system that we call free range harvest is the kids and the community and anyone that kind of comes and visits this town park can just have their part in the in the forest garden and kind of start to build that connection to where their food comes from um, and uh, and draw kids into feeling that nature is here to take care of them. Education takes several forms here. We've got much more formalized programs and then just more informal programs. Again, the facility is open as a town park, so there's self-guided tours and opportunities for people just to come in and engage and connect at their own time. And then we have more kind of organized, facilitated programs, which we see one happening here. Uh, this is our Earth Keepers Community Day Camp. And so Earth Keepers was actually originally started by John Denver. Uh, and we inherited the program about 10 years ago. So this organization was kind of seen as, as the closest incarnation to what the vision was for, for Windstar Foundation, which was John Denver's. And so when that organization folded, we got to inherit a lot of the assets and okay. carry forward a lot of the, the activities and programs. Uh -huh. So you'll see little remnants of John Denver everywhere. Okay. Um, just right over here, for example, that Peace Poll was John Denver's Peace Poll. It was given to him by the founder of the Peace Poll organization. And so that same guy came out here and we kind of transplanted it from his facility to our facility and had a ceremony on it. That's, uh, that's great. Yeah. So Earth Keepers is our main program. Uh, during the school year, we also keep the facility open as an extended classroom. 
When school is in session through the school year, kids come out here, uh, utilize the space as an extended classroom. We also have uh, uh, programs that we facilitate together with the teachers out here. Uh, and we do after school programs as well. So there's pretty much all through the year, there's, there's children and there's activity happening. Education yep. 365 almost. Yeah, right. uh, yes, Education 365. The idea being that um, this system can be act as kind of an alternative to the school garden model. Oh, um, yeah. Because we know that school gardens are incredibly effective at everything from test scores to behavioral issues statistically. Hi. <laughs> um, but we also know that school gardens fail much more frequently than they actually make it, big picture. Uh, and the reason that they fail is because uh, teachers are already so overworked and underpaid, mm -hmm. but then also because the school year t tends to be the opposite time of the year as the garden season, so there's not really anyone around to take care of the garden when school's out of session. Uh, yeah. um, so the concept oh. here... The concept... <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, can you guys come out and go back to the class, please? Yeah. <laughs> Youth. <laughs> so, so the concept here is rather than every school needing to internally fund and internally take care of and internally manage their own programs uh, as it relates to the garden, here the, um, the, 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 the idea is that the facility is externally managed, externally funded, externally taken care of, utilized during the garden season when school's not in session, but then made available to the schools free of charge during the school year. Oh, okay. And we're centrally located between seven schools, so oh, it's, great. it's basically within a short drive to be able to come and use the facility as an extension to their own program. How many different plants or herbs or everything that you're growing here? Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds if not thousands. Yeah. So we've got we've got a very very wide variety of plants and herbs and medicines and uh, vegetables and fruits that we're growing out here. Um, everything's kind of designed to integrate and to become an ecosystem. So there's there's just varieties that, that kind of occupy each layer of the system to take care of the functions within that layer. So this forest garden is much younger than the forest garden that we saw when we came in. And uh, the difference between this forest garden and that one is that we kind of learned as we went uh, to really utilize the resource more effectively. So our footprint used to end right where that tree was. That was the edge of our lease bounds. Um, we recently negotiated a new lease that gives us access to much more land. We were on two-thirds of an acre, and now we're on 15 acres. Uh -huh. We're on a year-to-year -year lease, now we're on a 20-year lease. So that's pretty exciting. That is. Um, but before we expanded, the footprint ended just on that side, this side of that tall tree right there. And, um, and everything beyond that was part of the equestrian operation. And now, um, and this was dry lot. So basically it was, it was land that, that there was no vegetation. And, um, and because there's a little bit of a slope, uh, whenever it rained, the, the nitrates in the manure and the topsoil would often kind of work its way down to the creek. Right. And what we know about when nitrates make it into water systems right is that yeah. we can have big problems downstream, right? We got the yeah. dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico as a testament to what happens on a large scale, what happens on a small scale as well in communities. And so, um, so part of our concept here at the Farm Collaborative is to always look for our greatest challenges. What are the biggest issues that we face and how can we turn those into opportunities for something else? So in this particular situation, when we were noticing that really wonderful soil and nutrient base going into the stream and causing problems, we also you know, were aware of the fact that those could be incredibly useful resources for the garden ecosystem. So we built these gardens on swales, which is basically like almost like a ditch or a dam on the contour of the land, so that whenever it rains, all those nutrients would, would kind of erode down and be absorbed here on the site. So what is otherwise a major environmental problem becomes an, inqu an incredible gardening resource. And that's at the foundation of what we do here is identifying those challenges and turning them into opportunities. Right. Guys. Hey guys, we don't need any more irrigation in here. You can put the hose down and go back to the house. I got it. Thank you. So welcome to the tropics. Yes. So this is a fully integrated tropical ecosystem. Wow. And we can maintain tropical conditions in here year round uh, using the equivalent ener energy output of about two light bulbs at any given time. So very, very little energy going in, very high yield coming out. Are you doing the battery that Jerome? We do have a climate battery in here. That's our third heat source. Okay. Um, so our first heat source is greenhouse effect. And this greenhouse effect is extra strong because our polycarbonate is five layers thick. So it's kind of like five greenhouses stacked on each other. Now that does decrease the, uh, the light penetration that we get, so we have to maximize how we can capitalize on the sunlight in here, um, which is why the north wall is also reflective, so that mm -hmm. when the sun is low in the sky in the winter, we get a little bit of extra light bouncing off that back wall, 
that it doesn't, it doesn't leave the greenhouse, it actually stays in and gives us a little more extra light. Because that's really the plant's biggest challenge in the winter is, is having enough light to maintain. Yeah. Um, second heat source is thermal mass. So everything in here is oriented south. So you, we'll, we'll see in the back there's fish tanks uh, and a rock wall that's perpendicular to the winter's kind of low winter light. So that capitalizes on that heat, stores it in here and, and allows the sun to go further. All of our garden beds are south facing to really capitalize on that low winter light as well. Um, all, basically everything that's massive in here is oriented to capitalize on the heat. Okay. Uh, and then our third heat source is the climate battery that you were just talking about, which is that great subterranean heating and cooling system. Um, and that's really our main energy user. Uh, basically thermostatically controlled, so when the temperature goes above a certain point, the fans fire up. It grabs the hot air from the greenhouse, pushes it into the ground, um, goes through a network of underground piping that exhausts it as air conditioning when it comes to the other side. Uh, temperature drops below a certain point, those same fans kick on, take that cooler air, put it in the, in, into the soil, diffuse the hotter air, and we get heating. And that alone would probably give us Mediterranean temperatures in here year-round. Um, but we wanted to push it a little further and get tropic. Uh, so we added a fourth layer of heat source, which is the solar thermal panels. And we can see those when we oh, walk out. Okay, right. um, and so basically about three feet below the surface of the soil, um, we've got almost like a thumbprint in each garden bed that's just coiled hot water pipe. And then that radiates up mm. um, when it picks up on the sun. The panels are oriented at a very steep angle so they pick up on that lowest winter light so we get the most heat when it's right. the coldest outside. Right. And then that basically then radiates up. It also interfaces with the climate battery that's below it and gets that extra heat to, to radiate into the greenhouse at night on those really cold nights. Um, and then that gives us tropical conditions. And so um, in order for the system to really work, everything also has to be laid out strategically so that everything, all the plants and, and, um, and heat systems can interface most effectively. And you said all those energy inputs power up two light bulbs? Correct. Yeah. yeah but, well, two light bulbs, basically two 60 watt light bulbs being on all the time. It's kind okay. of equivalent energy output that we have in here. So those fans are, um, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't, they're not on all the time, the climate battery fans. That's cool. So those two, when each, each one of them is about two light bulbs, but again, they're only on maybe, you know, 15, 20% of the time. <laughs> and, then the, um, and then to run the solar thermal system is just some really kind of low wattage uh, pumps that just circulate the water through the system. So it basically cycles the glycol that exchanges with water when it gets in the greenhouse, just in case someone dug too deep and pierced the line, we wouldn't get glycol all over the beds. Mm -hmm. Here in the southern side of the greenhouse is our, um, is kind of our two big nitrogen fixing trees. Um, this one's a leucaina and this one's a locust. And uh, these are kind of the pioneers of the tropics, if you will. Um, these trees are incredible for a number of reasons. The, the young greens can be sautéed and eaten up like spinach, really high in trace minerals and nutrients. Um, excellent fodder for animals. Um, when we see our bunnies, I think we actually just did a pruning, so you'll see that they're munching down on these leaves right now. Okay. Um, the plant is incredibly fast growing. So if you go to the tropics, you'll see these guys along the edges of the highway, anywhere that gets deforested. They're just kind of those pioneers that, that come up really fast. and. Um, and they also are nitrogen fixing. Oh, all right. And so basically, whenever we um, take plant matter off the top of any plant, you know, that's the, the plant will release root matter below soil, which is a big way that we fix carbon, just mm -hmm. in general, in, in, our, in, our, uh, in the carbon cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever animals graze or plant, you know, any kind of plant matter is cut down, then that below surface uh, roots are sequestering that carbon. Same thing happens with the nitrogen. So this plant has that symbiotic relationship with the bacterium that lives on its root. And whenever plant matter is taken off the top and those roots are released, that bacteria becomes available nitrogen for the soil. So how that all fits together and why these are in the south of the greenhouse, these are incredibly fast growing. They canopy and cover the entirety of the greenhouse for the summertime. Um, and then, uh, and then in usually in November or so, we'll come in and hack these back all the way to the stem. Really? Yeah, so you can see on that guy, all that growth is, is basically new growth since the fall. All the way back to the stem, yep. And then what happens, we get this huge light flush in the greenhouse because we need all that light, we don't want the shade anymore. Uh, and then we get that huge nutrient flush because all the, all the nitrogen is being released and made available to the soil that, was, that is attached to the roots of these guys. Uh, and, um, and, then, you know, and, then, and then when we grow it out, it's, it becomes our living shade cloth in here. Mm -hmm. So rather than having to put shade cloth over the outside of the structure, which is very labor intensive, degrades our polycarbonate, 
and um, and is resource intensive to, to, to keep getting that shade cloth. Um, we just grow it on the inside and then capitalize on all the extra functions that come with that shade. The aquaponic system in the back um, is mostly being used right now as a fertilizing resource for our cuttings that are in the garden beds. So in the summertime we load these with cuttings, so it's the plants that we really want to cultivate and incubate. We'll just take cuttings of them and jam them in and then they kind of grow out and then we spread them like Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, and then these guys are being fertilized because they have no soil, right? They're just being grown in clay. These are just basically burnt clay pellets. Um, and so the nutrients come from the fish poo and the turtle mm -hmm. poo mm -hmm. and the lizard poo. They kind of hang out inside of these aquaponic tanks. So those guys poo, gets cycled up, gets filtered through the system. The plant's taking those nutrients. The water is then delivered clean without the nitrates and oxygenated back to the fish. So in order to feed the fish, because I, at, there was a point where we wanted to cultivate fish for meat in here, mm -hmm. we realized that the energy input was a little more than, than we wanted to use with the system, so we stopped that. But when we did, um, we designed it to where under our feet here is a worm farm, and so that we could basically get the protein input for things like tilapia, because they need a lot of protein to be able to grow to, to become uh, producers. Uh, we, could, we could get that from basically the worms that we're raising in the path here. Everything in this greenhouse operates like an ecosystem. It's kind of a, a closed loop ecosystem similar to how Biodome was. The difference is that Biodome ultimately failed because it was trying to shut nature out, which is physically impossible because mm -hmm. everything is nature, we're all nature. And, um, and nature in the form of bacteria came into the system through the roots, through the soil, and uh, created just kind of a big collapse. Mm -hmm. so, um, so in order to not have that happen here, we not only uh, understand already that nature is everywhere and everything, but we also embrace nature coming in in all its forms. And so our doors on the greenhouse are oriented to the prevailing winds, so that whenever there's any kind of wind, it sends into the greenhouse birds and bees and butterflies and fungus and bacteria, uh, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some of it's great and helpful and helps to balance some of the bugs that, that naturally occur in the system, and then some of it can be really harmful. But even the harmful stuff is beneficial. Mm because we can strengthens see strengthens the system exactly it, it, can it get control of it absolutely yeah so it's uh it helps to build resiliency right so we can see right here a, a, a good example these two tomatoes side by side right same plant or same came from the same uh, uh the same the same parent plant but for some reason this guy here you can see got hit really hard right and it's just not doing so well and this and this neighbor Basically, the, the same plant, but had a slight genetic predisposition to be more resilient, is able to handle whatever that fungus is um, and, and survive and thrive. And so that's the one that we'll save seeds from. Right. Because as that relates to kind of our, our bigger picture ecosystem here, uh, we know that in the atmosphere right now, um, they say that there's about an average 15 year lag time between the carbon that we're experiencing right. and the carbon that's actually in the atmosphere. So even if we turn climate change around today, which we can, we have the technology for, but it's gonna be a big push. Mm -hmm. um, so, but even if we were able to say today, okay, it's, that's it, official, you know, stop all emissions and, and let's turn climate change around, um, there's still a 15 year, roughly, lag time between what we're experiencing on the ground and what's actually in the atmosphere. And we know right. that we've emitted more carbon now than we were 15 years ago, so we know that the, the weather conditions are going to get a little worse before they get better. Right. And the plants are the first responders, right? When, when we have extreme weather episodes, they're the ones that respond because it, it kind of has that impact on the fungus bacteria balance. And so, um, so building that resiliency in this system is a way that we can help to build re that resiliency for other plants in the region as well. So uh, we actually have two programs that are happening at the same time right now. We've got our Earth Keepers Junior program that just arrived. And that's these little guys, zero to five year olds coming with their parents and the kids in our Earth Keepers program are kind of their, their mentors. They're guiding them through the system so that the idea is that all the kids that have been here through the week have a chance to mentor the little ones on oh, what they right. learned and test their learning. Yeah. When we first came to the site here, everything was basically just that, that very barren um, uh, horse dry lot. And so all the plants, all the vegetation, everything that you see was brought in. And, uh, and it's, we've been here for just a, just a little over seven years. And so we're now starting to see a little bit of balance restored. And you can see like the, the birds are starting to come back in. 
um, and we came. We, there was very few birds that had anywhere to be here, right. um, and the insects, and the butterflies, and the moths. So the ecosystem starting to be restored. So we've got uh, another one of our learning spaces here behind us. This was John Denver's teepee. <laughs> so one of those handprints are John Denver's. So you can see the solar thermal, that was the fourth heat source for the greenhouse. And, uh, and prescribing to the ethics of permaculture, um, and the, or to the principles of permaculture, everything has to be multifunctional here. So when we put in a big piece of infrastructure like this, it has to perform multiple functions. So this particular piece of infrastructure is also the shade structure for the chickens. And then the chickens, these, this particular flock of birds are integrated right into the classroom because they're the composters for all the leftover food in our kids' programs. We have bunnies right in the heart of the garden um, because we were identifying one of our challenges here was what people would consider to be weeds, right? Plants that we didn't cultivate that are coming up. Well, bunnies are very, very good at turning any plants into bunnies. So we put them right at the heart of the garden such that all of the, the refuse that we get out of the garden um, becomes a resource and basically we convert weeds into bunnies. Um, we're now actually getting to a place where we need more weeds. <laughs> so the kids in the program help to take care of the animals and these girls are about to milk blue, uh, the mama goat of these three. Uh, and these Nigerian dwarf goats are very, very small. They stay small. Um, but the content of butterfat in their milk is super, super high. So their milk is incredibly sweet and goes a lot further in cheese making. You need much less quantity to get a lot further because of the, the content of fat that's in there. So the milk's a little sweet, huh? Very sweet. In this system, we're actually not using this half right now. We're, we're, we gave it back to the chickens. Um, but this would be a really great season for having some of our crops out in the open, right? Our cabbages and our maybe our collards and our radishes would be really happy outside right now. Um, and then, uh, and so, but you know, you can see inside the greenhouse, we've got squashes, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Those can grow here, but they need to be under cover all year, you know, right through the heart of the winter. Those will be done, um, you know, this fall, September, October. And, um, and even under cover, you know, they won't really be able to make it any further than that. So at that point, we'll roll the greenhouse back over here and can start a whole nother season of those cold hardy crops, right? And keep those all the way through maybe December, mm. uh, at the, at the, in which point these guys, these guys are kind of done and expired. And then we roll the system all the way back to the chicken coop and then give it to the chickens. So then the chickens have access to all this, they break it down, they find the bugs in the soil. And we found that since we did this, before we were seeing about an 80% decrease in egg production in the winter time, which is pretty on par with the other farmers. And now our egg production is only down about 10% in the winter. Oh, 70%. Yep. Just by simply giving them a space to scratch and give themselves dirt baths and be happy chickens. Happy chickens, more eggs. So that's, that's the basis of the system that we've had for the last seven years here out on the site. Um, this last April, after a very long political process, we were able to negotiate from a year-to-year -year lease on two-thirds of one acre to a 20-year lease on 15 acres. And so with that, we were able to lock in uh, and, and kind of feel more confident about leveraging resources on here, financial resources, and build out the system more. And so we've expanded into the pastures around. Um, we're putting a lot of infrastructure on the ground, and we launched a capital campaign to help fund everything and to build out the infrastructure necessary to make this stuff really take off. So in that field over there, those five acres uh, have... Um, 700 fruit trees planted in them. You can't quite see them from here because they're just about as big mm -hmm. as the grasses. Mm -hmm. But you can see the rows in which they're planted in. And we're basically utilizing the, the themes that we've learned from the forest garden, but putting it out on a production scale. And so um, basically the, uh, the fruit trees create shade for animals that are rotating in the alleys between them. It's a system called alley cropping. So the way that alley cropping orchard works is we've got the fruit trees on the contour. In the space between, in those wide alleys, we, we, we basically give a lot more space than a usual orchard would. And then we do rotational grazing through those alleys. 
<clears throat> obviously there's a number of, of systems going on and um, inputs and outputs, but the main purpose for Farm Collaborative is to educate the future. Yeah, so so we talked a lot about the, the why we do some of these different, or how the how we do some of these systems, but not so much about the why, and you're kind of alluding right to it. Um, and the how is really important, or the, the why, you know, the why we do these systems is really important. Because on a global scale today, when we look at, at the, uh, the footprint that our food system occupies, um, we know that it's between 30 and 60% of all global greenhouse gas emissions are tied to our food system. So that's when you take um, chemical usage in, on the farms to um, landform change when we're basically turning rainforest into farms to cathodes to, to the yeah to all the different parts of the infrastructure to the silly packaging and the refrigeration and the transportation of our food system it actually creates a footprint that's larger than any other industry it's it's really kind of our biggest contributor we kind of see our role as the farm collaborative is to help usher in the shift that you're talking about and help to create systems that can support future farmers, that can connect children to where their food comes from and to the environment around them. Because when we have a connection to something, then we start to care about it. When we care about something, we start to develop a love and then actually you know, want to steward it and, take care and, and, and make it available for others. And so that um, you know, our programs are really centered on connection, which I think is actually, maybe yeah. it's another conversation, but I think it's our biggest, it's our biggest kind of loss right, right now globally. It's the, it's the part, you know, we, we're, we look at all of our systems in a siloed way. We don't look at them in, in the interconnected way in which they work. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have such a lack of connection on a global scale to each other and to the natural world. And I think that's actually the source of our biggest challenges. Even with the human body, we take everything individually almost. And there's a doctor for, you know, right. nervous system, the intestines, all of this. And instead of taking it as a whole... I think we're just beginning now to treat things holistically and as a full functioning organism instead of everything separate like you were saying. That's right, so. that's right. And so, so th this kind of agriculture, um, we're calling it integrated agriculture, kind of like integrated medicine. Mm -hmm. Integrated mm -hmm. agriculture where all of our resources become, all of our wastes become resources and everything is kind of self-contained and creates that ecosystemic impact uh, on our community and on our health. And so that's kind of the, the role that the Farm Collaborative plays is to help to create the systems that can help make our local food system thrive in a way that takes care of our natural environment. And so this is our flagship facility, uh, but big picture, we want to see these everywhere. Yes. Uh, and that's why we're the collaborative, is, is we don't see ourselves as the ones taking this on. It's going to take everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so we see ourselves more as just kind of the, the ingredients to help bring, bring the other players together and to, and to network and to work together on this big challenge that we face. Because not only is there a massive environmental issue, with our food system, contributing you know up to 60% of all of our global greenhouse gas emissions tied to food, yeah. um, but we also have a farming crisis in the United States right now. The average age of a farmer is 59 years old, mm -hmm. and so um, by some studies, unless we have major innovation or a major breakthrough, we're going to lose our capacity to feed ourselves within the next decade. Mm -hmm. And that might actually be a conservative estimate because right now a lot of the farms aren't even really growing food for humans, right? Yeah. A lot of it is is just feed. Yeah, and, they're paid not and, to even grow. Yeah. And then, and then those that do grow, a lot of that is not even being eaten here, right? It's getting yeah. sold to China for feed or for corn syrup. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you know, bringing, bringing our, our food system back into, into reality and back to the ground so that we can actually take care of each other. And the exciting thing is when we do that, we not only can decrease, um, you know, this big challenge that we see, but we can also have a systemic effect on, on our climate change challenge. Um, so Project Drawdown that was edited by Paul Hawkins um, looked at the 100 top solutions for turning around climate change. Uh, 13 of the top 20 are based in agriculture, yeah, or based in our food system. That. So the idea is that, that, that if we can just slightly revisit how we're growing food, um, we not only cut off the back end of, of the emissions that are produced from the farm, well, you know, it kind of as you go even further than that, we, we can take the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the ground. Right. So yeah. we can turn around climate change with the same problem that causes climate change yes. in the, in the yeah. first place. Carbon farming is what some folks are calling it. Even. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Pulling the carbon from the atmosphere through ground co or cover crops and things like that, the animal systems, everything you're doing. Yeah. So. And I believe that that's what's going to usher in the next generation of farmers. So young people today are interested in getting into this field. 
And if we can change that economic picture, we can get them engaged in the field in a way that's not actually destructive for our ecosystem, but incredibly beneficial. And so we're really excited about, about playing a role in that. And so some of the systems that we have on the ground here are working on doing that with our local food system. We just launched an equipment library in partnership with Pickens County Open Space and Trails, where basically we're purchasing some of the more costly bits of equipment and then making them available at a subsidized rate for our local farmers. Mm. Um, and that can help a farmer scale from you know, maybe a, a two or a four acre farm to a seven or eight acre farm in a season. Um, we, we actually I run a, another uh, foundation in town here that's called the Two Forks Club and we make 0% interest loans to farmers and food entrepreneurs. And we found that those equipment were some of the greatest demand for what people were looking for resource for. Mm. And, um, and so by having them kind of you know, centralized in a way like this, they're, they're, then we just basically take the financial burden as a nonprofit and make them available for farmers. Uh, we can help have a, a bit of an impact on that. The other thing that we're doing now, um, just through serving our local farmers, we've identified that housing, just like with anything else in the Valley, is our biggest challenge. And so we're in land use approval right now to build out a housing library. They'll basically be like a, a mobile tiny homes that we can dispatch to farms for the growing season. It's not going to solve the problem, but it can maybe put a band-aid on the challenge um, to, get, to get more uh, workers to our local farmers. Um, we're also building out, I'm going to show you some design plans, for a, a more robust learning center and food hub that will actually be from that cone about to these trees here. And, um, and that, that learning center will be a space where we can have conferences and events around um, regenerative agriculture. Uh, it will also be a space where um, we'll have a, a learning kitchen and a community kitchen that the farmers will be able to come in um, you know, with their tomatoes at the end of the season and make tomato sauce or um, you know, with peaches and make peach preserves. So we'll have a small cannery line in there as well. And the whole basement will be a root cellar that we'll be leasing space out as well for farmers to, to bring their product further as well. That's great. Um, and the other thing that's exciting about the center is the day that it's built, um, the, the, you know, we're only going to have conferences here a handful of times. So the rest of the year, the, that conference kind of space will be use, usable for our programs like we have today. Um, and on top of that, we'll be able to launch three year-round preschool classrooms that will occupy the space. So wow. we'll get to start the kids really young here yeah. on a year-round basis. Um, and then we'll have a small farm stand for, for both goods from our own farm and, and from other farms that people can come and, and purchase their product here. So here's our here's our, our kind of our, our bigger picture plan. You can see the heritage orchard up here as it grows out with the incubator plots that will eventually span that way. Um, the dome that we walked in, the rolling greenhouses, um, and this will be the, the it's right on the other side here, our future learning center, um, which we're designing in a really uh, environmental regenerative way as well. And, um, and so the entire project is going to cost us about $6 million. And I actually just found out this last week that we um, were $4 million of the way there. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, That's so great. We, we hope to break ground on this this coming, this coming fall. Is there any way that people can reach you? Is there a website? Is there any social media they can kind of keep up to date with what's going on here? Or? So we're, we're the Farm Collaborative. So they can find us on social media or at thefarmcollaborative.org. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, we always have volunteer opportunities out here. Um, we're staffing up quickly, so we're, we're also looking for qualified uh, folks to, that want to take this on as a career pathway. And, um, and there's, there's tons of ways to engage. So yes, we would love, we'd love to, to have more people from our wonderful community engaging with this. Project. Cool. Sounds great. So thank you so much for coming Thank in. you. Thank you. Good luck with everything. We need more people like you. Thanks once again for taking the time. <laughs> So how cool is that? Thank you for joining us on this adventure. If you haven't been here before, you have to come here, especially if you have kids. They have an absolutely amazing educational program, as Eden was saying. They even have day camps for kids, so bring them on out. You can be enjoying Aspen, I'm sure, at the same time. You may just want to stay here as well and learn yourself. Thanks. See you next time. No, not